Hi, everyone. Welcome to your podcast, New Books in Economic and Business History. I'm your host, Javier Mejia from Stanford University. And today I have the great pleasure to be with Harold James. Harold is professor in European Studies at Princeton University, where he's also professor of history and international affairs at the School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton and an associate at the Benham Center for Finance. He's the author of a book that is going to be published soon. You can pre-order it uh, already. It's called Seven Crashes, the Economic Crisis that Shaped Globalization. We're going to be talking with Harold today about the book and his career. How are you, Harold? Thanks. It's it's, it's good being with you, Javier. It's it's, it's really nice uh, having this opportunity to talk. No, it's great that you're here. And before getting into the book that I, I found fascinating, I would like to ask you about your your origins, about your life and your career. There's something sure. that um, I find very interesting about your career, which is that you have been able to mix very well and fit well in different communities. So you work in a history uh, department, but you're very close to public policy, even to um, management and entrepreneurial uh, environments. What was the path to reach to that place? How did you end up uh, being the, the scholar that you that you are today? Well, thanks. I, 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 I mean, that's obviously also a question of, about chance and serendipity because, uh, you know, many things just occur in a kind of rather random way. I started off working on the Great Depression in Germany. That was what my PhD thesis was on, on monetary policy during the Great Depression. And then I came to Princeton in the middle of the 1980s, and uh, it was a very, very stimulating environment, and I thought about lots of things. And um, Princeton had a, has a great economics department, uh, but there were some inspirational figures there, uh, particularly Peter Kennan, who did international economics, and Ben Bernanke, who came to Princeton actually in the same year as I did and was interested in the U.S. Great Depression. And so it, it was just a, a wonderful chance to have the opportunity of talking to those uh, the, those figures. And then later in the 80s, uh, Paul Volcker came to Princeton after he'd been the uh, chair of the Federal Reserve. And it, it, was a, it was a dynamic and interesting environment. And... You know, that's when I started to get interested in the story of depressions, how they can reverse globalization, what the future of globalization is. And that was obviously a topic that was beginning to be really interesting and hot in the 1990s. That's interesting. I mean, now that you mention it, it's true that Princeton seems to have this very strong connection with monetary policy and, and, and the Fed, right? Um, but let me ask you a bit more about that. And I'm... I'm curious about your opinion on how history is um, moving probably further from traditional topics of these big questions on economics. And it's probably considering each time more things about culture and and social dynamics. And, and it feels that every time history departments are probably farther away from econ departments and, and, and some other uh, type of more practice-oriented um, departments in universities. Do, have you noticed some of that? Is that uh, something that you have been concerned at all? Do you think that the future is uh, problematic in that sense? What's your, your take uh, sort of bridging those, those two worlds? Yes, you're, you're, you're right. Uh, I mean, history as an academic discipline has changed over time. And for a long time, it was really concerned with political history. And in the 1960s, there was more of a push to do social history and also a lot of economic history. And uh, the new economic history in the 1960s, the mathematization of economic history, really took off at that moment. And you thought that you could apply economic techniques to, to history. Um and then in the 1980s, uh, there was really a turning, so just the moment that I arrived uh, at Princeton, as it were, there was a turning away from traditional social history and more towards cultural history, as you say. And uh, actually, I mean, that was also a 
great moment in in the life of the Princeton department in the sense that there were these these really big figures, uh, Natalie Davis and Robert Danton and um, uh, slightly younger Anthony Grafton, and uh, you know they were they were pushing a social history, a very novel kind of social history. So history history has gone in in in, in waves. Um, I think uh, since the global financial his, uh, crisis, uh, since the the two thousand and eight crisis. Um, there is more interest in economic history and history departments, uh, and certainly I see that among students and among graduate students. Um, but you're right that many historians don't really have the skill set to do that. And so if we think of the contemporary problems of the world, we're facing big economic challenges, uh, climate challenges, um, security challenges. Um, Actually, all three of those were really areas that academic history had moved away from a bit. And I hope very much that uh, these will come back into the mainstream of historical writing. That's great. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you have a rather op optimistic uh, take on, on that issue. And I guess that your work helps in uh, continuing that, like those traditions, right? And And with that, probably I would like to start to get into uh, the main theme of your book that are our crisis right and and indeed like your title is very insightful right just so very early on you said well this is these are seven crashes these are crises and we're gonna learn about them right and and I have this sort of like meta level question uh, before we get into the the argument of, of the book. Um, which is uh, how you think about crisis in the sense of uh, forces of change in, in social and in history, let's say. And, and I'm asking you this because I'm, I'm teaching this quarter, um, a course, it's, it's called Societal Collapse. It's for undergrads here at Stanford. And we start the course with uh, some ideas of how time is perceived and how it can change. And there's this sort of tradition of catastrophes. And if you think about some of the natural sciences in the very long term, they think that the world has evolved as a result of massive extinctions, for instance. If you think about uh, George uh, Cuvier, you would say like, you know, it's this massive crisis have been an essential uh, fuel of uh, the reshape of the world, right? And I, I perceive some of that spirit in your um, view of crisis as a sort of uh, force for the regeneration of of the system. So it's not a, a view of, of, of how tragic crises are, but they seem to bring the seed of, of something good. So I, I want to hear your your view about that, how crises are important or are an essence for the evolution of the system. Yes, I, I mean, you're absolutely right that there are moments when events seem to be moving very, very quickly and our sense of time is shorter and shorter and our horizon gets uh, narrower because everything is, is happening so quickly. And, you know, obviously at the end of his life, uh, Cuvier was living through the French Revolution and the uh, French Revolution is exactly that kind of moment of a crisis when many, many things are uh, rethought. And... Um, the, the the book, as it were, is a little bit of a pushback against the idea that either the current crisis or every kind of crisis leads to a falling apart or to a deglobalization. And uh, I'd worked a lot uh, before on the Great Depression, and the Great Depression did strike me as being exactly that moment when the world fall, falls apart and uh, it's segmented into regional blocks and there's a strong emphasis on national policy, autarky, and uh, a famous article by John Maynard Keynes uh, on national self-sufficiency in 1933 that was then taken up, uh, very widely cited in the United States. Uh, it, it blends well with the thinking of the New Deal. It was also taken up enthusiastically and translated into German, so it, it fitted with the thinking also of the Nazis in Germany that the, they wanted to turn uh, 
turn in on themselves. Um, so, you know, we, we'd had that moment. And uh, what I wanted to do in the book really was to suggest that not all crises work like that, uh, that they don't always splinter up the world, but some crises actually push the world in a different direction. And some crises push for more globalization, more interconnectedness, more flows of goods, of people, of capital. Uh, and um, so that that's really, as it were, the the, the fundamental observation of the book. But, you know, your general point, your meta point, as it were, that uh, crises are um, moments of opportunity where things need to be rethought. Many, many things have to be rethought. Uh, the role of government has to be rethought. The role of private business has to be rethought. Uh, how the economy works has to be rethought. And, you know, obviously you saw in the book also that I wanted in each section uh, to have a treatment of how economists were thinking about the world and how economics is also contingent on the way in which the world is changing. Right, right. That's that's great. And I, and I would like to ask you now, and moving from that like very like metal level to more concrete uh, dimension in which your book is very rich and, and of on the details of the historical context and the discussions of the moment. And and it's about the fact that these are seven crashes, right? So I want to ask you why these are seven and not eight or 10? And how did you pick the specific crisis? What, are, what were the elements that made you consider these were crucial, the crucial crisis? And I'm thinking that, for instance, you... You don't have here World War II, and, and actually, a, a good way of thinking about this would be to this: what are these seven crises? So uh, our audience is going to be start to get familiar with uh, more specifically what you're focusing on. But how were you thinking about uh, this? Why this crisis were part of the book and not some others? Were there some that were just below the threshold? Um. Well, it's 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 a, it's a very good question. Uh, you, you know, obviously, there's a kind of charm about the number seven, if you like, number mysticism that we have. Uh, you know, the seven deadly sins and and uh, and so on. But it, it's not just uh, randomness. I really wanted to think about the moments when economic thinking changed, and um, you know, that obviously is difficult because time flows into itself and uh, crises are always complex and so you know, there's not one simple crisis in many of these instances um, so let, let me just list the crises maybe for the, for uh, our listeners viewers um, I start with the crisis of the middle of the 19th century and particularly the shortages and the hunger crisis of the 1840s and then I think about the what was called by many people at the time the Great Depression in the 19th century, the uh, crisis that started really with big stock market panics in Central Europe and also then a bit later in the United States in the same year, 1873. I think about the First World War. I think about the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. I think about the 1970s and the oil uh, shock, I think about the global financial crisis, and finally I think about both the pandemic, uh, COVID, and about uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, now, you, know, you, 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 you raised the question in, when, you, when you were asking me this, um, why not some more crises? And so you know, is it really the case that the Ukraine war blends into the COVID crisis? Well, I think in some ways it is in the sense that the COVID crisis raises the question of shortages. And what Russia had done for a long, long time, long before 2020, uh, is to instrumentalize its control of energy supplies in order to try to leverage politics. And a moment of big shortages is an opportune moment to do that. And so in that sense, there is, I think, a connection between the shortages of COVID and the shortages that are then uh, 
induced by the uh, attack of the 24th of February uh, 2022. Um, you also raised the question of why I don't think about the Second World War as a crisis. Um, and, you know, obviously, in many, many ways, the Second World War is the seismic event of the 20th century, and it's a kind of central hinge. It's much more of a global war than is the First World War. Uh, the First World War, I think, is really mostly a European war, though it's fought out a little bit in some of the European colonies. But the Second World War really is a global war. And, uh, you know, it's even, I think, f for many people, uh, a little bit problematical to say when the Second World War begins or ends. I don't think it begins on the 1st of September 1939 with the German attack on Poland. I think there's a powerful case to be made that it starts in 1937 uh, with the Japanese invasion of China. And similarly, it doesn't end with the defeat of Adolf Hitler, but it ends with the atomic bomb, uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and then the Japanese uh, surrender. But the Second World War is, to me, very, very much an outcome of the Great Depression. I think it's it's unimaginable without the Great Depression. And... Uh, you know, I think you can tell that story particularly clearly if you focus on the Japanese case, uh, where Japan is looking for how to maintain this export drive that was characteristic of the Japanese economy in an age in which you're turning into yourself and turning into regional blocks. And so the push into China and then into, into Korea, uh, the, the expansion in uh, Southeast Asia is... I, I think one story with the reaction to the Great Depression, a militarized reaction to the Great Depression. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's also difficult to imagine the Nazi seizure of power and the collapse of democracy in Germany without the severity of the economic depression that produced these very, very large numbers of votes for the National Socialists. And, um, you know, indeed, the you know, a large part of the Nazi platform and the rhetoric is about national self-assertion and limiting internationalism. So there are striking speeches of Adolf Hitler where he makes the, the enemy international connections. And, you know, that's, that's often a euphemism for, for Jews. Uh, so this fits very much in with the anti-Semitic program. And in some ways, uh, he plays out this anti-international theme and expects his audience to hear an anti-Semitic theme and it mobilizes the audience. So it's, it's a powerful m mobilization. I mean, all this is just to say uh, that the Second World War, uh, the, uh, the evolution of uh, Japan, and Germany, even the turning of Italy from, you know, in the 1920s uh, with a fascist dictator, uh, Benito Mussolini, Italy played along quite well with the rules of the international game. In the 1930s, it doesn't anymore, and it starts to expand and wants at once empire. So I'm, I'm really... that's why I don't do the Second World War. I, I you know, I think of it, and I, I treat it in the book as well as an outgrowth of the, the policy decisions no. to the Depression. It's it's great that you you mentioned this and and you expand on the connections between these different crises because um, I mean that helps me to think about a couple of concepts that are very important in your the theory that you try to uh, push in, in the book, which are the different roles of the shocks that societies are being exposed to, right? So. Um, I'm going to ask you to take us through what the theory is and, and you're going to point out in, in the book that supply shocks are fundamentally different from uh, from demand shocks. And, and I think that it's great that you have made this connection between different crises because that already signals what are really the shocks that matter, right? What are the exogenous dimensions of the story? And that's I think that's uh, a, a great element there. But yeah, please take us uh, through that um, hypothesis around why maybe supply shocks are 
uh, convenient, uh, depending on, on on the on the sign of of those for for globalization. Right. I, I, I mean, so absolutely. First of all, um, uh, you know, that's absolutely right. That's the theme of the book. Uh, that's that's really central uh, to the argument of the book. And uh, you know, you you might think you're an economist. Uh, you've had this in economics one hundred and one um, that you can neatly distinguish between supply shocks and demand shocks because in for instance a negative supply shock uh, the quantity that's produced is uh, is going down uh, but the prices are going up and so prices and quantities uh, move inversely to each other um, in a negative demand shock uh, the prices are falling and the quantities that are traded are falling as well. So the Great Depression is a big collapse of prices, but also a big collapse of world trade and a good, uh, uh, you know, big collapse of the amount traded in particular countries. So uh, GDP is going to fall everywhere in the world. Um, and, um, you know, you, you, you also know uh, that economics gets more sophisticated as you go on. And so, you know, you're often taught that what's taught in Economics 101 is not really ever true and that it's all much more complicated than that. And that's true. Um, and often it's difficult to distinguish supply and demand shocks. And in particular, the First World War, uh, I, 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 I kind of do that exercise and try to Try, try to unravel that a little bit. Um, but the, the the neatest ones, I think, are the negative supply shocks, um, uh, the 1840s and the 1970s. And uh, they correspond, I mean, the most important figure of my book, really, the, the key to the argument of it, is the figure that shows the growth of world trade relative to GDP, to world GDP. Um, and uh, you can see in the middle of the 19th century, that's the first great surge after the 1840s. That's the first really great surge of this globalization. And uh, that's the era that I think it's now conventional among economic historians to call it the first era of globalization, as distinct from the second era of globalization, which people sometimes have problems getting the precise chronological definition. Uh, but I think if you look at the trade story, it's very clear that it, it takes off from the late 1970s. And uh, that's where the share of trade in GDP is, 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 is growing. And uh, so what follows from that is more and more globalization. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's got a kind of self-accelerating, self-developing uh, uh, process that, that is, is then launched from the uh, end of the 1970s, but uh, these are the two moments where you know, both uh, the, 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 the there's a severe, severe crisis. And, you know, in the 1970s, I, I remember that still because uh, you know, that's when I started to go to university in 1975. Um, and there was a sense that institutions were failing everywhere, that democracy was failing. And in the middle of the 19th century, there was even a greater sense of crisis. I mean, this was when there were the European revolutions and uh, the whole of the continent uh, was swept by revolutions and the old rulers were swept away, incompetent rulers were swept away. And in both cases, I think um, there was a search for competence in government and there was a search for capacity in business. So business had to adjust and that involved also resetting the legal framework for business so that joint stock companies were uh, largely the product of the crisis of the middle of the 19th century. You think you, you need something to manage the new technologies. Um, and one of the things I wanted to do in the book was to show how the, both of these moments, the negative supply shocks in the middle of the 19th century and in the 1970s, they're driven by technologies which were fundamentally around already, uh, but which are taken up uh, as a response to the crisis. And so uh, the steam engine is really old, uh, but uh, the, the, and there are, in the 18th century, it's mostly stationary steam engines pumping water out of mines. 
in the 1820s and 1830s, there are a few isolated railroads, but they don't really connect with each other. And it's only in the middle of the 19th century that you really see what the railroad can do, which is establish a network, or what the steamship the equivalent can do across the oceans is to link the world together in a new way. So uh, you know this is this is this is transformative, but it's an old technology. In the 1970s, uh, container shipping again it's a rather older concept. Uh, there was a regular container shipping line just between New York and Florida since the 1950s. Uh, but in the 1970s, it becomes a big network. You need the container ports in order to be able to do containers. And, you know, my thought about the the, the COVID uh, pandemic and the recent episode of a negative supply shock is that this was also a moment when some technologies that were already there um, in medicine, but also in communications, got widely taken up. So, you know, we could have done a video chat years and years ago, and people did do these video uh, uh, meetings, but the massive popularity of it is a product of, of the COVID crisis. Um, the use of the mRNA vaccine is a product of the COVID crisis, and we're learning now that it can be used in many, many applications. Um, as you can treat cancers and uh, the whole range of diseases that can be treated uh, with the mRNA uh, technology. So each of these three crises, I believe now, is really prompting a, a revolution in technology and then a revolution in globalization. I'm, I would like to continue with the, this uh, theme of... Um extracting the lessons from each of these crises. And, and I'm glad you made this parallel because I was going to ask you about this, the, uh, the similarities between the, um, the Great Famine or, or this crisis in the middle of the 19th century and, and, the, and the Great Inflation in the 1970s. And I think you very um, eloquently show the, 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 the similarities. But I would like to hear about the differences because... Certainly, they were very similar, and 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 you ended up with this in both in both cases um, push for more globalization, but they were different, many different ways, right? So you could argue that the great inflation had uh, the supply shock was happening from the point of view of the Western world outside, um, if if you're taking into account um, um, oil uh, shortcuts and so on. But um, but so I guess my question is, what were those differences and why weren't those differences uh, leading to a different sort of direction? Why was uh, at the end this uh, similarities that were related to both being a negative uh, supply shock, the ones that are... Uh, driving this big takeaway, which is uh, the push for more globalization. Right. Uh, absolutely. I mean, nothing ever repeats itself precisely. Um, you know, having said that, uh, I am struck by the way that we keep on returning to the same even the same geographic areas that look as if they're at the center of a big problem. So, you, you know, I, I, I uh, partly um, wrote the book, or finished writing the book uh, in Istanbul, uh, looking over the narrow strait of the Dardanelles and looking at the ships that were coming through or not coming through, the ships with um, Ukrainian or Russian grain that were needed to feed the eastern Mediterranean. And without that, there was the likelihood of hunger and unrest in uh, many parts of uh, North Africa, but also as far away as Indonesia, this uh, was having an effect. So, you know, you could see this narrow waterway. But that was exactly the story in the middle of the 19th century as well. It was the story in the First World War that the Dardanelles were really, really uh, crucial to uh, the, the the supply, um, but you know you're right about the differences, obviously, because the fundamental 
problem in the middle of the 19th century was the question of getting a food supply for Europe. And um, that couldn't be solved without the development of large scale agriculture and the opening up of the communications that allowed those farmers in North America and South America and the Russian Empire uh, to export their grain. So the 19th century globalization is fundamentally an exchange of foodstuffs and other commodities from a group of countries that some people then call the periphery or it's subjected to a either formal imperialism or a kind of semi-colonialism. So uh, people think of the relationship of South America to uh, the North American world and the European world in the 19th century as a kind of semi-colonialism. Um, in the late 20th century, it's a different story. The fundamental issue there in the 1970s is about scarcity, but it's also about the conditions in which you produce. And so the globalization of the late 20th century is, um, is really about uh, the, uh, the development of production all over the world and the creation of complex supply chains. And, you know, there's a, there's a, a beautiful book on that. I think the best analysis of it is by uh, Richard Baldwin. Um, but, but this globalization is, is a result very, very different to that of the 19th century. And, you know, in the same way, I, I don't think that what we're going to see after the shocks that we're living through at the moment is going to be a repetition of either the first globalization of the 19th century or the second globalization of ever more complex supply chains. It's going to be about the application of, um, of, of data and the use of, of data, the services that can be done in a weightless economy uh, across the world. So the, the next globalization seems to me to be, you know, be already developing, uh, but it's, it's clear that it's not a repetition of the first two either. So these were the ones that were more clearly you could see a supply shock uh, being at, at the core of the events. Um, at least three of the seven crises that you defined, they were characterized more than anything as uh, the man shocks. Um, what's the story there? So help us please like think about what uh, was happening here. I guess we're talking about, well, the Great Depression, and and the global financial crisis at least and yeah. and then the great war probably would have to put it uh somehow there with uh, probably a more messy, it's more uh, messy but... story but yeah i would like to hear then what's um what's the outcome when crisis seems to be seems to be dr driven by by demand shocks yep um in, in, indeed, that's that, that, that's right, and that looks like a very different breed of crisis in the sense that the diagnosis can be clearer there, and uh, you know, the really brilliant uh, diagnosis and compelling diagnosis is offered in the middle of the 1930s by John Maynard Keynes and the f most famous exposition of it, the General Theory of Employment, Interest and Money is published in 1936. Um, and uh, there the story is really simple, that uh, if you have a deficiency in demand, um, then you need coordinated action, above all by governments, to remedy that and to supply more demand, to make up the gap in demand. And uh, you, you deal then with macroeconomic aggregates. And um, you know, that's also, I think, very much the response to 2008. And uh, 2008 drives the resurgence of Keynesian economics. And uh, Robert Skidelsky has a really nice book on the return of the master. And uh, one of the economists that I look at um, Larry Summers stands very, very much in that tradition of thinking in terms of big aggregates. And, you know, it's right in those situations, you need more demand. You also need a stabilization of the money supply. I mean, this was a story 
about the Great Depression and uh, the version of monetarism that is associated with Milton Friedman is also about aggregate macroeconomic stabilization. But in this case, more in the case of not allowing the money supply, the money stock to collapse as it did in the Great Depression, uh, but to maintain uh, the money stock. And both of those lessons, uh, the not allowing the money stock to collapse and uh, putting the fiscal stimulus in, were effectively learned in 2008 and then then pursued. And uh, you know, if Larry Summers is, as it were, the inheritor of the Keynesian tradition, uh, Ben Bernanke is also very, very explicitly uh, the heir of the Milton Friedman tradition of not allowing the money supply to collapse. And he did that with enormous success and uh, with, a, with a great deal of attention to the particular details of that, yes. I, I mean, I'm trying to think now about um, some of the crises, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking specifically about one crisis uh, of the seven that you mentioned and how it fits in this um, model of uh, supply versus demand shocks. And, and it's a crisis of the late 19th century, right? In the 1870s, you have a crisis that seems to be driven by um, financial outcomes, at least like a financial um, crisis. And, and it's one of these crises that I think that at least in the public opinion, um, it's not particularly present, right? So probably many people would have been able to guess at least five of your seven crises. I'm thinking now, but probably they would have missed, if they would have missed one, it would have been that one, which right. for an entire generation was the Great Depression up until the other big Great Depression yeah. uh, took the, the title for that. So help, help, help me navigating that crisis. What was it about? How does it fit in, in, in this discussion between supply shocks versus demand shocks? What were the consequences of that? Well, uh, maybe, and that was your very first question as well, maybe it shouldn't deserve to have a separate section on it. Uh, it's not really a fundamental collapse in the way that really basically all the other events that I look at are, it's it's actually the response to a positive supply shock. Um, so it's the financialization of the process that uh, we were talking about, this opening of the continents, the construction of railroads, and both the original crash in 1873 in, in May, and then the, uh, the, the uh, crisis later in the year in uh, in the United States, uh, um, uh, both of those are fundamentally focused around railroad construction and it's uh, it, it, the, the railroad stocks that uh, companies that fail and uh, bonds that are defaulted on uh, on, on on railroads. Uh, so um, it looks much more like a, a financial crisis. And uh, you know, so I, I, I also uh, talk a little bit about uh, you know, the way that it really isn't a crisis in the sense that uh, the others are crisis. And Anna Schwartz, uh, Milton Friedman's collaborator, used to use the word pseudo-crisis to describe this sort of situation. So it's a pseudo-crisis. Um, why it's important to me, though, is that uh, this is the moment that cements the view of the world that relative price movements matter and uh, the interest is in relative price movements rather than in the overall rise of prices in a famine um, or the collapse of prices in a business depression but it's prices moving against each other that set the signals and so it's 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 a fascinating moment because um you know, the ideas are already around uh, but they don't get a lot of acceptance and then more or less simultaneously in the English-speaking world, uh, Stanley Jevons, in the Francophone world, uh, Leon Valgras, uh, and in the German-speaking world, uh, Karl Menger in Vienna, have this vision uh, which you know now we, we think of as marginalism and uh, that uh, everything is shaped by the uh, 
for the, the movement of prices at the margin. And so the the terminology, basically, and also, I mean, even the discipline, um, uh, Stanley Jevons was the person who coined the term economics uh, to describe the discipline that uh, you're in. Um, before that, it was called political economy. Uh, but, you know, Jevons thought that that was unnecessary. It isn't really politics that set these these prices. Uh, they're, they're, they're set by the balance of supply and demand, and they motivate actors uh, to respond to them. And that, that kind of central observation um, is really a product of the crisis of the 1870s. And it's in the 1870s that marginalism um, becomes the, the, the key of our discipline. I, I want to add, I guess I want to go back to <clears throat> the beginning of our conversation and and to reflect a bit on this idea of how crises are, are crucial. Um, and I'm wondering now, what do you think about the non crisis periods right and and i'm i guess I, I would like to hear um how much do you think that we actually do need indeed this crisis to uh move on a certain type of of direction do you have any specific thoughts on that sense um have you ever thought about a sort of like contrafactual in which some of these crises didn't happen and what would have been the outcome of, of the world or more specifically of, of globalization in the absence of those is the, I don't know, I, I would like to, to hear about that. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a fascinating question. I, I don't really think all that much in terms of counterfactuals. Um, I, I, I I, I, I can't really work out how I would construct, for instance, a counterfactual in which the First World War doesn't take place. Um, and you know, the, the First World War is a kind of crucial moment, and it it produces a, a pushback against this kind of uh, marginalist view of what economics is all about. Um, so... Uh, you know, what's the best way of thinking about that? I mean, maybe to think that uh, any of these processes, uh, these crisis moments, they lead to institutional reform and to new structures. And then, you know, those new structures gradually produce inefficiencies and injustices and uh, growing discomfort with the injustices and the inefficiencies that are, are resulting from it. So um, you know, the middle of the 19th century, uh, the world accepts the idea that migration is good, that trade is good, that capital flows help countries to develop. And by the early 20th century, already before the First World War, I mean, actually back in the 1880s already in the United States, there's a growing disenchantment with migration, a feeling that uh, migration is eroding the uh, incomes and the wages of those who are already in the country. Uh, the trade is is damaging and uh, is leading to a loss of jobs, or the capital flows are destabilizing. Um, and so th th there's, a, there's, a, there's an increasing sense that uh, of a political backlash against globalization. And again, it's been nicely studied. Um, uh, uh, Kevin O'Rourke and Jeff Williamson have done, done really the fundamental work on that. Uh, and so in many ways, the, the kind of sentiments that then erupted in a radical way in the Great Depression are already there before the First World War, so these anti-globalization forces, and then they're, they're unleashed by the military conflict and by the security conflict. But uh, you know, I think I think you can tell the story in those terms of, uh, of backlashes developing. Um, I, I would like to ask you one final, and probably also difficult question, because um, I would like to hear what some um, you're feeling about globalization in the future and considering that 
a good part of uh, the way you think about it is the result of crises that are to begin with hard to predict. I'm, I know I'm asking you probably something very difficult, but how do you feel? Are you an optimistic about globalization? Do you explore some of this when you reflect on the consequences of of the pandemic and, and so on? But um, yeah, how, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, the the last sentence of the book is really a riff on a uh, on a quotation from uh, John Maynard Keynes at the Paris Peace Conference, where he said uh, in 1919, uh, all this makes it increasingly probable that things will have to get worse before they can get better. And I, I think that's a that's a wonderful quote. Uh, you know, the, it will have to get worse. You know, you can see, and we're in many ways in this moment currently that we're in. Uh, you know, everything looks as if it's getting worse. The uh, war in Ukraine looks insoluble. How do you get to peace? The um, uh, things will have to get worse before they can get better. And uh, but I, I also wanted to emphasize the second part of the sentence: they can get better. And uh, we have the technologies. We're using the technologies already. That will help them get better, and um, you know what I think gives me the confidence about this is that uh, you know now even more than in the early twentieth century, uh, citizens in countries and voters make judgments about the competence of their governments, and if they see governments dealing with things incompetently and inefficiently and unjustly. They revolt against them, and uh, we, if you want to be optimistic, we might see that happening in Russia. The military campaign is managed with appalling brutality, but also appalling incompetence. Um, the economic mobilization is also really running into the sands. Um, uh, I, I expect a protest movement there to uh, to, to uh, develop, and. Um, you know, that looks like the world of the middle of the 19th century, but what's created after the, those collapses is a, is a better world. And um, in that sense, uh, we already see the glimpses of a possibly optimistic future. I love that. I love that you finished with this uh, optimistic note. A cautious, optimistic one, but, but optimistic uh, nevertheless. Um, I want to thank you. Um, you wrote a fascinating book. Uh, I hope that um, most of the people that are listening to and, and seeing our conversation are, um, take the time to, to go into the details. It's full of rich context and, and interesting stories. And, and also, I want to thank you for taking the time for having this conversation. This was, this was very nice, um, Harold. Well, thank you so much, Javier. <laughs>